How are you doing today? I hope you are having a great day. I wanted to show you one of my favorite books for studying the Bible, the synopsis of the four gospels. So what is that, you might ask? There are lots of different examples of synopsises, and you can find some online. You can download a copy for yourself. For example, the New English Translation, the Net Bible Synopsis is available. I'll have a link to that underneath this video so you can go there and check it out for yourself. But I really don't like them because they just lay out the parallel text next to each other. You really don't see a word for word, phrase by phrase parallel. Gold standard is definitely the synopsis of the four gospels from the United or International Bible Society. And they have a different cover now. It's black with like a depiction of the four gospels on the cover here. I'll have a link to that on Amazon if you're interested in the show more section under this video. And it's available in English. I've got English Greek here. I've got a Greek Latin. You can get in French, German, and Spanish, I believe as well. The English text is the revised standard version. I think mainly because they have access to that copyright. So let's turn and take a look at the healing of Peter's mother-in-law in Matthew chapter eight. You can see that they just don't juxtapose the three accounts next to each other, but you can actually see word for word, phrase by phrase, how they are similar or different from one another. Excuse me for a second here, but I'm gonna set up another camera right next to myself here so that we can get some good top-down images of the text while I talk about it. I'm probably making this video a lot more complicated than it needs to be with using two cameras and top-down, but let's see how it works out. A synopsis lays out parallel passages, teachings or activities of Jesus, parallel to each other, side by side. However, if one or more of the Gospels don't include that particular pericope, they're going to leave it blank. If we look at the Lord's Prayer, for example, there is nothing in Mark or John about the Lord's Prayer. That's because they don't include it in their Gospel. Prayer itself is not in Mark or John. The other thing I really like about the synopsis is what you get to do with it. And you get to color it in. A long time ago, I realized that grad students aren't that much different from kindergarten kids. You put a crayon in their hands and you let them draw something and they love it. So I always look for ways to make my assignments creative and unusual, something they haven't done before. Now this video really isn't about coloring a synopsis. It's about the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And I'm going to use the color coding of the synopsis as a tool to get at the heart of that story. So let's take a look at the context of this story first. In the video on the structure of Matthew's Gospel, I mentioned how it's organized around five cycles. And these cycles consist of a collection of Jesus' teachings and then his actions are collected in the following chapters. So in this particular case, the first cycle, in chapters five through seven, we have the Sermon on the Mount. Now in chapters eight and nine, we have a collection of Jesus' actions. Matthew really wants us to see that Jesus is mighty in word and deed. In Matthew 8, verse 1, Jesus descends from the mountain and it concludes the Sermon on the Mount. He is immediately met by the leper on the road. In this particular story, right after the man is healed, Jesus commands the person to go and show himself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded. Matthew wants you to see that Jesus is not abolishing the law. In fact, if we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus taught that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. This brings us to chapter 8, verse 5, the healing of the centurion's servant. Now, this story compares and contrasts with the story of Peter's mother-in-law in a number of ways. Male versus female, Jew versus Gentile. He entreats Jesus, she doesn't. Jesus doesn't enter the centurion's house, but he does enter her house. Now, if we compare Matthew and Luke's account of the healing of the centurion's servant, Luke tells us about how the Jewish elders come and ask Jesus to heal the centurion's slave. Matthew leaves this out. The centurion goes straight to Jesus. Now, hold that thought for a moment, because we're going to see how this plays out in the healing of Peter's mother-in-law as well. And what I want to show you is how synopsis is useful for studying the Gospels and how to use it. To do this, we are going to do some color coding. You can use crayons, highlighters, but I am 
preferential to colored pencils. And you'll see why in a bit here. Here is the color code that I use. In fact, I even wrote it in the cover of my synopsis so I don't misplace or forget it. The color code I use, and I'm going to show you, is not special to me, and I didn't come up with it. Basically, I surveyed a number of different authors who talk about color coding a synopsis, and I looked at the color code they use, combined it, and I kind of used the principle of five out of six dentists can't be wrong. So what do most of them have? Well, we're going to color something in blue if it's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If it's just in Mark and Luke, we're going to color code it yellow. If it's just in Mark and Matthew, we're going to make it green. Then if we have something that's in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark, we're going to make that pink. And finally, if we have something that is unique to that particular author, we're going to color it purple. Now, I know that seems rather like a stretch to remember all that, but I'm going to have it on the screen for us here, and I'm going to show you how to do it. So it all will be revealed in due time. Now, I'm going to put my synopsis away here because what I did was take the synopsis and transfer it to my iPad. So we're going to have a slightly better view here on the iPad. Now, in context, in Mark and Luke, right before the healing of Jesus' mother-in-law, Jesus exercises a man in the synagogue. Matthew doesn't follow that order. Why? Because as I pointed out earlier, Matthew collects stories, he collects teachings into certain chapters, and he collects events into other chapters. And so he doesn't quite follow the same chronological order that the others do. Now, how do we color this text? I'm going to use my iPad so it shows up in the video, but I highly recommend that you do it with paper. In fact, I've already done it in paper on another copy of the synopsis I have. Yeah, I know I've collected a few of these over the years teaching. I've held you in suspense long enough. Let's start coloring this story in. We're going to start with blue because that's what's common between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now you'll notice as we color in the words that are common in all three between Matthew, Mark, and Luke with blue, not much gets colored in in this particular story. This helps us to see the basic skeleton of the story, but not much more than that. Jesus enters Peter's house. Peter's mother-in-law is sick. Jesus does something, and the fever leaves her, and then she serves. Now let's color in the words that Mark and Luke have in common. And we're going to use yellow for that. The very start in Mark and Luke mentioned that he left the synagogue and went to Peter's house. And the reference here to leaving the synagogue and entering the house forms a nice transition that moves us from one pericope to the next. Mark and Luke also refer to Peter as Simon. Now, I colored Simon differently than Peter that we're going to look at in Matthew. And it comes down to an interpretive decision on your part. Do you see this making a significant difference between calling him Simon or Peter, or is it just strictly a stylistic thing? This brings up an important point I want you to observe here. It's not just coloring the text in, but you're going to have to make interpretive decisions as you go. And this is why I recommend using pencils so that when you change your mind, you can erase it and correct it. Now on to Matthew and Mark, what they share in common. And we're going to use green for that. Remember, this material is not found in Luke, just Matthew and Mark. Well, there's not much to that, is there? How about what Matthew and Luke share in common, but is not within Mark? Once again, we don't have much, but we're going to have to use pink to show this. All right, we're beginning to get a picture as to how they're similar or different. Now we need to look at what is unique to that particular gospel, and we're going to use purple for that. Let's color Mark in first, and this is going to help us to see a couple things right off the bat here. Only in Mark's gospel are Andrew, James, and John mentioned, and how they tell Jesus about her. Immediately after this, Jesus comes, and he takes her by the hand, and he lifts her up. He depicts it as a very human interaction between the disciples, Jesus, and Peter's mother-in-law. On to Luke's gospel, and we're going to color what's unique to him in with purple as well. 
Notice in Luke's account here that he tells us that she was ill with a very high fever and also that they besought him and he stood over her and rebuked it and immediately she rose and served him. This is much more dramatic than Mark's account. Luke depicts her as having a high fever and instead of having the disciples speak to Jesus, they come up and besought him or beg him. Then when Jesus heals her, he stands over her and he rebuked the fever. It's much more dramatic, it's much more intense. And Luke wants us to see the dire situation that she was in, the concern of the disciples and the authority that Jesus has. Mark, on the other hand, presents the story in a very humane way. Jesus comes, he takes her by the hand, and he lifts her up. It's very gentle and it's very personal. What about Matthew's account? Well, we got to finish coloring in here to take a look at this. Now, there's not a lot of differences here, but they are significant. Let's see how good your memory is. Remember in the story of the centurion servant, I told you that Matthew drops the reference to the Jewish elders. He does the same thing here. One of Matthew's traits as a storyteller is to cut out anyone he can from a pericope or event in Jesus' life, except for Jesus. This makes his gospel laser beam focused on the person of Christ. Two little observations here. From a first century reader or a hearer's perspective, this story would have been very provocative. Jesus enters Peter's house and then he goes over to his mother-in-law who's laying in bed. Going into somebody else's house without the men present and then going over to a woman laying in bed just was not done. It was socially verboten. Second, the disciples are omitted completely from the story here because he wants to focus just on Jesus. He touched her hand. Now this is a very highly condensed version of Mark's taking her by the hand and lifting her up. And then finally, in Mark and Luke's account, when she is healed, she gets up and she serves them, most likely something to eat or drink, hospitality. Matthew has, on the other hand, she served him. So is this important, the difference between him and them? Matthew portrays Jesus as knowing her needs. No one has to tell him. Jesus also meets her needs. No one has to ask him. And finally, the response of faith. She gets up and serves him. Now, the word for serve here is the same within all three, but I think it takes on a slightly different nuance within Matthew's gospel. It's like serving someone a really nice hot cup of coffee or tea when they attend your house. But it got extended within the New Testament to refer to people who serve within the church or serve Jesus, deacons. Matthew portrays, I think, Peter's mother-in-law response and faith as one of serving Jesus after he touches her. Now, I'll include links to the United Bible Society synopsis in the Show More section under the video and also to the Net Bibles version of the synopsis so you can take a look at those or buy one if you like. I don't get any money from this. Now that you understand this and you've seen how to use it, this makes a great Sunday school class, Bible study, or youth group. And I'm giving this to you for free. All you have to do is photocopy a story from the synopsis or print one out that's found in more than one gospel account because you need to be able to compare them. Pass the photocopies out, then stick a bucket of crowns in the middle here and explain the color code. Then let them go to town. The great thing about this is you don't need to teach them anything. Once they're done color coding in the text, start asking them some questions. How are the accounts similar? How are they different? What do these differences reveal about what the author is trying to teach us, etc.? Now, if someone tries this out and gets to use it in an actual class or teaching situation, please drop a line or a comment below and let me know how it went. I would love to hear how your experience was. This is a fun way to study the Bible, and I hope you enjoy it. Until we meet again, peace. Thank you.